Okay, Hermione is asking Neville to report Malfoy to Professor McGonagall. <laughs> you really think that's going to straighten Malfoy out? Considering McGonagall's character, as was established all the way back in Chapter 9, what would most likely happen is that McGonagall would put Neville in detention rather than Malfoy on the grounds that bunny hopping up the stairs was against school rules. Go to Dumbledore or maybe Flitwick, but whatever you do, don't go to McGonagall. <laughs> Spoiler warning, this is an in-depth retrospective and story analysis of the entirety of the Harry Potter books, one chapter at a time. If this is your first video in the series, it is highly recommended that you begin watching this series from the beginning, which you can do by going to the playlist that I provide right here. Okay, now that everyone is all caught up, let's continue. So, Harry learned his lesson from Dumbledore and decided not to go looking for the Mirror of Erised again. However, he continues to have dreams at night about his parents vanishing in a flash of green light. Recall from Chapter 2 that the green light is one of the few things that Harry remembers from his parents' deaths, and recall from Chapter 7 that he had a dream about Quirrell's turban giving off a flash of green light, and the audience should seriously start connecting the dots by this point. So Harry is hard at work training for the upcoming Quidditch match against Hufflepuff. Wood drops the bombshell that the referee for this upcoming game will be none other than Professor Sneak. This, of course, sends the team into a panic. Everyone apparently knows about Snape's bias towards Slytherin, which begs the question. If his bias is so well known, why doesn't Dumbledore do something about it? More importantly, why doesn't anyone call Dumbledore out for not doing anything about it? That last question is the most important because the first question, why Dumbledore doesn't do something about it, actually does have an answer. As we'll eventually learn, Snape is an important double agent in the war against Voldemort, so Dumbledore literally can't afford to fire him. At least not until Voldemort is gone forever. But none of the students at Hogwarts know that! At least when Snape's history as a Death Eater comes out, Harry questions Dumbledore's trust in Snape on a regular basis, but nobody ever questions why Snape is allowed to be such a dick to his students? Of course, while six out of seven Gryffindor Quidditch players are just worried about Snape favoring Hufflepuff just to keep Slytherin in the lead, the Golden Trio are convinced that Snape isn't just biased, but actually wants to kill Harry. We, the audience, know that Snape has the exact opposite intention, at least after we've already read this book, but as I pointed out in Chapter 10, the Golden Trio come to a reasonable conclusion based on the evidence they observe, and since Hagrid actively refused to give any counter-evidence when he had the chance, then as of the events of this chapter, the Golden Trio are totally justified in fearing for Harry's life. However, even given the Golden Trio's limited understanding of the circumstances, there is at least one factor they apparently aren't considering. How is Snape supposed to get away with jinxing Harry's broom if he's the referee? In the first game, Quirrell was most likely able to avoid detection because nobody was looking at him when he was casting the broom bucking curse. Everyone was focused on the game, not Quirrell. If Snape is the referee, Hermione won't be able to light his robes aflame while he's trying to save Harry's life, but at the same time, if Snape wanted to kill Harry, it would be a lot harder for Snape's actions to go unnoticed since he'll be taking center stage, literally, when he does them. I don't blame the Golden Trio for not thinking about that, since all the other evidence they have at the time points to Snape having not only sinister, but downright homicidal intentions, but it is something worth considering in hindsight. Harry points out that, if he backs out, Gryffindor can't play at all. Keep that in mind, because it's going to create a plot hole in the final chapter of this book. So, as soon as Harry mentions that, Neville comes bunny-hopping into the Gryffindor common room because Malfoy had put the leg locker curse on him just because he fucking could. 
Neville acts like a typical victim of bullying, thinking that reporting Malfoy would likely just bring more trouble, and like I said at the beginning of this video, knowing McGonagall, it most likely would. So Harry decides to cheer him up by offering him a chocolate frog. Neville eats the frog, but gives Harry the card. At first, Harry is disappointed to get yet another Dumbledore, but suddenly switches from disappointment to elation when he realizes that this chocolate frog is the key to finding Flamel. In both this chapter and the last one, it was said that Harry remembered reading about Nicholas Flamel somewhere, and this is it. For the rest of the series, Harry's memory will actually be one of the most convenient plot devices in the entire series, and in a series that is often rightly criticized for having new spells be penciled in at a whim to solve nearly any problem, that's saying quite a lot. Sometimes, Harry will conveniently forget things after only a few minutes that he should have no business forgetting ever. Other times, he'll remember months later the minutest of details that he had only ever been exposed to once before in his entire life when he had a dozen more important things on his mind. Harry always remembers exactly what the plot needs him to remember, and to hell with whether or not that makes any sense. And the worst part is, this isn't even an instance of plot convenience that can be swept under the rug because of the series' trademark get out of plot holes free card of Because Magic. Harry's plot convenient memory isn't because of any magic, it's just shitty writing. Anyway, this is the first time in the series when Harry's plot convenient memory is used to, well, enhance the plot. However, at least in this specific instance, Harry's memory is being used in a reasonable and believable manner. It makes sense that Harry would remember the name Nicholas Flamel, but also makes sense that he wouldn't remember everything surrounding the name since he was nervous as fuck about going to Hogwarts. Don't get used to this though, because after this, Harry's memory will start to get very, very contrived. So now that Hermione knows that Flamel is known as an alchemist, she is instantly able to find Flamel's claim to fame. He's the only one in recorded history to have successfully created a Sorcerer's Stone. So, we have finally reached the point in the story where the elusive Sorcerer's Stone has been name-dropped, so I obviously have to stop and talk about it for a little bit. Sometime last year, J.K. Rowling unleashed a slew of supposedly transphobic tweets that has since become the most controversial aspect of the entire Harry Potter franchise. However, prior to that, this stone was probably the most controversial aspect of the series, specifically the fact that it was renamed when the series was brought over to the USA. In the UK, where this series was originally published, the stone in question was called the Philosopher's Stone. However, when it was brought over to the USA, the stone, as well as the title of the book, was renamed to Sorcerer's Stone. This name change is a highly controversial and heavily polarizing one, and has sparked numerous debates over the years of varying levels of toxicity. Those who argue that Americans should call it the Philosopher's Stone, even when the books they read call it the Sorcerer's Stone, usually rely on three main arguments. There are probably other arguments out there, but these are the only three I've seen gain any serious traction. The first is that the Philosopher's Stone is actually a real legend that exists in the real world. The legend, not the stone, obviously. The second is that the American publisher only changed the name because they thought American children were too stupid to know what a philosopher was, and so continuing to use the term Sorcerer's Stone is only enabling their demeaning view of their own customer base. The third is that Philosopher's Stone is the original name, and so we should adhere to the original simply for the sake of adhering to the original. I find precisely zero of these three main arguments to be compelling or persuasive in the slightest. First, there's the argument that the Philosopher's Stone was not made up by Rowling specifically for this series. There are plenty of artifacts and things that were indeed made up specifically for this series, like Boggarts, Dementors, etc. But this is not one of them. 
The Philosopher's Stone has its origins in real-life alchemy, a long-since discredited pseudoscience that was actually practiced in the real world many centuries ago. The goal of alchemy was to create a Philosopher's Stone, and so renaming the Philosopher's Stone to something else obscures its true origins. To that I say... so? While some people many hundreds of years ago might have believed the Philosopher's Stone to be more than a mere myth, in the 20th and 21st centuries it is now definitively in the realm of fiction. So why does anyone care that this series might be taking a definitively fictional artifact and just modifying it a little bit? Bear in mind that Greek mythology is also something that the people used to believe was real, and yet, nobody cares if an author takes elements from Greek mythology and just does whatever the fuck he wants to do with them. A few chapters ago, we had a three-headed dog that was clearly inspired by the Greek mythology creature Cerberus, who originally guarded the gates to the afterlife to prevent any living person from entering the afterlife before it was their time. Nobody raised a shitstorm over the fact that this dog in this book was guarding the key to immortality, literally the complete opposite of what his Greek mythology counterpart originally guarded. So why should it be any different with the stone itself? So I'm sorry, but I do not find it to be a compelling argument that we should rigidly adhere to the name Philosopher's Stone simply because it's a legend in real life, especially when that argument is applied so selectively. The next argument is one that actually has the potential to have some merit to it. The argument that it was only changed because American publishers assumed that American children are too stupid to know what a philosopher is. The argument here is that, by adhering to the American title of this book, we are effectively vindicating and enabling the people who made this extremely demeaning decision, and encouraging a American publishers to look down on American children in similar ways in the future. Since this sort of insulting behavior is not something to be encouraged, we should insist on calling it the Philosopher's Stone just to remind everyone that our kids aren't dumb. This would actually be a compelling argument in favor of rejecting the name change were it not for one tiny little problem. It is demonstrably untrue. Those who were actually present for the discussion of how to name the book have since spoken publicly on the matter. According to them, they weren't worried that American kids wouldn't know what a philosopher was. Rather, they fully expected American kids to know damn well what a philosopher was, and when they saw the word in the title, to assume that this book was a story about philosophy, not magic. They wanted a title that more overtly screamed magic for the first book in the series. That's literally all there was to it. But even barring that, American readers don't need to know what a philosopher is in order to follow the events of this book. Hell, British readers don't need to know what a philosopher is to follow the events of this book. The book gives us a paragraph explaining exactly what the stone is and what it does. So even if you've never heard the legend before, the story is still entirely accessible to newcomers. So why would you need to rename the title of the book just to avoid that kind of confusion? So that just leaves the argument that we should adhere to Philosopher's Stone simply because it's the original name for the item and we should give deference to the original simply because it's the original. This argument is just stupid. People like BuzzFeed journalist Ellie Bate, who argue that saying Sorcerer's Stone is just wrong, just piss me the hell off. Considering how dumb this argument is, its stupidity is further compounded by just how vehemently its proponents will argue for it. The sheer level of toxicity and obnoxiousness offered by these proponents of this stance is simply off the charts. Okay, first things first, this book is called Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. It is not called Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, and so I'm going to be referring to this book and this movie by their correct, non-insulting title throughout this review. Now if you'll excuse me, I'm off to burn down an orphanage and puppy farm. <laughs> now, to be fair, 
The Harry Potter fandom is not the worst offender in this regard. When it comes to levels of toxicity with which originalists will defend their originalist stance with insults and even death threats, the Dragon Ball fandom has to be the worst offender, at least of all the fandoms I personally have participated in. If you even so much as say the words Destructo Disc instead of Kienzon, or Kaioken instead of Kaioken, then people will cuss you out. The Dragon Ball originalists can rival Donald Trump's Stop the Steal conspiracy theorists in terms of how vehemently they oppose anyone who doesn't support their possession. In fact, I would argue that the Dragon Ball originalists are even worse, considering that they're getting their panties in a wad over the pettiest of reasons. With the Stop the Steal crowd, there isn't a shred of evidence to support their outlandish conspiracy theories, but if those conspiracies were proven to be true, they at least would represent a very real, very tangible threat to our democracy. For the Dragon Ball and Harry Potter originalists, you're becoming so toxic and so obnoxious over some works of fucking fiction. Jesus Christ, can you tone the hate down just a touch? Besides, not all changes from one country to another are necessarily downgrades. Let's take Dragon Ball for example. Sure, there are plenty of instances, mostly in the earliest years of dubbing when they didn't quite know what they were doing yet, where the ocean dubbing team made changes that are endearing primarily because of how dumb they are. The Home for Infinite Losers is probably one of the most famous, or infamous depending on your perspective, examples of such changes. But then, the Funimation dub made plenty of changes that were honest to goodness improvements to the story. Here is just one example. In the episode Free the Future, Trunks returns to his timeline and has a final showdown with 17 and 18. Now, in the Japanese version of this episode, Trunks flies in and, you know, he kills him. I mean, it's perfectly serviceable for what it is. There's absolutely nothing wrong with the way it's handled. But the Funimation dub adds in just four simple words that make this scene so much better and just hit you right in the feels. In the Funimation dub, and only in the Funimation dub, right before he kills Android 8, Trunks says this. This is for Gohan! Ah! Ooh, America. Fuck yeah. And that is just one example of how Funimation improved the story. Now, over time, the demand for a more faithful Dragon Ball dub started to grow, and Funimation eventually went back and redubbed the first few episodes of Dragon Ball Z with the goal of providing a more accurate adaptation. Of course, this adaptation often lacked a lot of the charm that came from these underexperienced dubs. Earlier, I said that changes like Another Dimension in Home for Infinite Losers may be endearing primarily because of how dumb they are, but they are still endearing. The more recent dubs don't even have that much going for them. But hey, at least we got to see Gohan's dick. So, yay for accurate dubbing, I guess. So yeah, I find the argument that the original should be given top deference for its own sake to be completely and utterly unpersuasive. If anything, the sheer level of toxicity given by some originalists will have the exact opposite effect. Rather than getting me to stick to the original, their attitude instead just lights a fire under my ass and inspires me to just use the American name even more. So, yeah, that's a Destructo Disc, that's the Guardian of the Earth, that's a Sorcerer's Stone, and if you've got a problem with any of that, then why don't you do something about it? Now go enjoy your four-year-old dicks, you pedophiles. However, I did mention how new adaptations from one country to the next can actually make improvements. Setting aside for a minute, 
the fact that I'll call it the Sorcerer Stone simply to stick it to the originalist assholes, there are actually quite a few advantages that the term Sorcerer Stone has over Philosopher's Stone. Some of you may find these reasons to be quite petty, and I will freely admit that my primary motivation is to stick it to the originalist assholes, and these subsequent justifications are definitively secondary. But for what it's worth, there are at least a few additional reasons to call it the Sorcerer's Stone. First, the implication in this book is that the stone is something only a wizard can create because many real-life alchemists actually attempted to create a Philosopher's Stone that undermines its magical roots. Second, there are many Philosopher's Stones in fiction. Kongit's Sorcerer's Stone helps give this book a unique identity, kind of like how, instead of Hogwarts simply being a the school of magic, it instead is one of several schools of magic that dot the globe. Hogwarts is its unique name, and Sorcerer's Stone is this stone's unique name. Maybe there are other Philosopher's Stones out there that are called something different. Third, the book has to explain what exactly the stone is and what it does. The series usually only does that for things that are unique to that series, like Boggarts or Dementors. We don't get full explanations or backstories behind things like goblins or werewolves because those things already exist in folklore, so it's assumed that the audience already knows what they are. Therefore, the fact that the story, not simply the title, felt compelled to take a detour and explain what the Sorcerer's Stone is and what it does heavily implies that it isn't something that already exists in folklore, meaning that calling it the Philosopher's Stone is actually counterproductive. Now, am I saying that you are not allowed to call it the Philosopher's Stone if you want? Fuck no. Hell, you are even free to continue calling it the Philosopher's Stone in the comments of this very YouTube channel, and I won't even bother correcting you. Heaven forbid I become the very thing I just spent about five minutes criticizing. However, just like with every other video on my channel, I will absolutely insist on you remaining civil with me if you are going to disagree with me. I spent the past few minutes getting angry at originalists, but only because their attitudes have to be seen to be believed. If you respect me, then I'll respect you right back. Deal? Deal. So now that I've wasted a good 10 minutes of your life, why don't we get back to the chapter? As Harry and Ron are discussing what they would do if they had a Sorcerer's Stone, it is said that they are sitting in defense against the Dark Arts, and they are taking notes on how to treat werewolf bites. This honestly confuses me. Later on in the series, it will become pretty firmly established that if you get bitten by a werewolf, there is no cure and no treatment for that condition. You get bitten by a werewolf, and you're fucked. Later on in Half-Blood Prince, Bill Weasley gets bitten by a werewolf who wasn't in his werewolf form when he bit Bill. However, the fact that everyone was unsure exactly what would happen to Bill suggests that this is an entirely unprecedented act. In other words, every single recorded instance of a werewolf bite in recorded history has been when that werewolf in question was in his full transformed state and therefore is untreatable. So how could the students be taking notes on how to treat something that is untreatable? Now granted, when I say that the condition is untreatable, that's not entirely true. In Prisoner of Azkaban, it is revealed that there is a potion called the Wolf's Bane Potion that can at least allow a werewolf to retain his self-awareness while he's in his transformed state. However, that can't possibly be what the students are taking notes on in this scene, because A, that doesn't treat the werewolf bites themselves, B, that would be a subject for potions class, not defense against the dark arts, and C, it is said to be an exceptionally difficult potion to make, so it should be well beyond the talent of first year students. So it honestly makes no sense that first year students would be taking notes on this kind of thing. Moreover, I highly doubt this is just another instance of J.K. Rowling not planning very far in advance. 
because werewolves are going to become a very important part of the main plot about halfway through. Lupin and Greyback will become major supporting characters, and werewolves' status as second-class citizens will be a huge factor in the overarching themes of inequality and bigotry. Surely, if J.K. Rowling had actually planned as much of this series out in advance as she claims she did, she would have known how important werewolves were going to be to the main plot. This isn't just forgetting what night of the week the first year students take astronomy or some other trivial fact like that. Werewolves' status in society is up there with Voldemort's horcruxes or Harry catching his first snitch by nearly swallowing it in terms of how important it is to the main plot. So why would Rowling take the piss out of that plot point by writing in a throwaway line of first year's taking notes on something that should be far above their pay grade. I can only think of one explanation. Rowling didn't know how important werewolves were going to become later down the line, and if we accept that, then that can only mean one thing. Rowling is lying out her ass when she says she planned 99% of the series out in advance. So anyway, Harry decides he's going to play in the upcoming Quidditch match. He decides that sticking it to the Slytherins is more important than his own survival. Of course, he's 11 years old, so his priorities are admittedly a bit out of whack. We also get the first instance in the entire series of foreshadowing that Snape knows legitimacy, something that will be concretely confirmed in Order of the Phoenix. Right before the game, Neville is surprised to notice that Ron and Hermione had both brought their wands to the game. Um... Why is that even remotely surprising? This is to set up for the exposition that Ron and Hermione had been practicing the Leg Locker Curse so they could use it on Snape from afar if he tried to pull any funny business. But why is it such a big deal that they brought their wands? Remember in the first game, Hermione used her wand to set Snape's robes aflame, so she obviously brought her wand to that game too. So why is Neville so shocked? So as the game gets ready to begin, Harry notices that Dumbledore was in the stands. So we now know that Harry's life is not in danger, since whoever put the broom-bucking curse on him last time, Quirrell, wouldn't dare try that again. Now, some people wonder why Dumbledore doesn't just fire Quirrell if he clearly already knows that it was him who cast the curse on Harry's broom last time. Well, I'm actually going to defend Dumbledore's in action here. We actually learned that it was indeed Quirrell who cast the curse, but neither Dumbledore nor Snape has any direct proof of that, at least not yet. When Snape is casting his counter jinx, he has to keep constant eye contact with Harry's broomstick. This means that Snape cannot look away for even a second to see who is casting the curse in the first place. With Snape in the air and Dumbledore in the stands, there are now two people on the lookout, one who can cast a counter curse, and the other who can scan the stands to see who is casting the curse in the first place. Once they identify the caster, then yes, there would be hell to pay for Quirrell, but Dumbledore is a staunch believer in innocent until proven guilty, so he isn't going to sanction Quirrell without any direct proof. So the game starts, and Snape proves to be every bit as biased a referee as everyone feared. Makes you wonder why Dumbledore would allow Snape to be so biased, especially right in front of him. Admittedly, Dumbledore has other, more important things on his mind, which is the whole reason he turned up for this game in the first place, but still he gives his teachers way too much discretion. Harry is able to catch the snitch in record time by utilizing a tactic where he stays above the rest of the game and flings circles around the pitch like a vulture. Using this tactic, he is able to spot the snitch in only five minutes, which makes you wonder why he doesn't use that tactic more often, since it's obviously so effective. During the game, Malfoy starts antagonizing Ron and Neville. One has to wonder why he doesn't antagonize Hermione as well, seeing as her being a mudblood is going to become one of his typical go-to insults towards the Golden Trio very soon and for the rest of the series. Anyway, Ron and Neville eventually pick a fight with Malfoy, Crab, and Boyle. Unfortunately, the worst that comes of this is that Malfoy gets a black eye. Neville gets knocked completely out cold. That's his reward for standing up to bullies. So, moral of the story, kids, 
don't stand up to bullies because you'll just get a concussion for your troubles. So after the game, I have to wonder exactly how much time passes between the end of the game and Harry returning his broomstick to the broom shed. It is said that he did so as the sun was going down, but the game only lasted five minutes. So when exactly did the game start? And what was everyone doing in the meantime? It is highly unlikely that they were celebrating their victory because as Harry returns to the Gryffindor common room, Ron informs Harry that the party is just beginning. Anyway, just as Harry is returning his broomstick to the broom shed, he notices Snape and Quirrell going off into the forest together, so he flies over their heads so he can eavesdrop on their makeout session. Snape confirms that it is indeed the Sorcerer's Stone that Fluffy is guarding. But then some background noise prevents Harry from hearing the start of the next sentence, so all Harry hears is, your little hocus pocus. Sadly, we never get any clarification as to what exactly Snape actually said in this sentence. In Deathly Hallows, Chapter 33, The Prince's Tale, we'll eventually get a buttload of context from Snape's point of view for a lot of things that previously made no sense or which lent credence to Snape's status as a red herring villain. But that chapter surprisingly does not contain any clarification of what exactly he said to Quirrell in this context. Then Snape does something that really baffles me. When Quirrell plays dumb, Snape just gives up and decides to have another chat with Quirrell once Quirrell has had time to decide where his loyalties lie. Why? In the film adaptation, this made sense. This conversation was mixed in with the events of the last chapter when Harry was wandering around the castle under his invisibility cloak. In that scene, Snape could sense that someone was there, and that's why he ended the conversation prematurely. But here? It honestly just seems like Snape was bored with Quirrell. So what gives? Then, as Snape storms off, Quirrell continues to look scared out of his mind. It's revealed in the final chapter that Quirrell isn't actually intimidated by Snape in the slightest because he thinks, most likely foolishly, that Lord Voldemort will protect him. His stuttering and complete lack of self-confidence is entirely an act. But who is he acting for here? Does he somehow know that Harry is right above him? In the very next book, when Harry is eavesdropping on the Malfoy business at Borgen and Burks, Borgen drops his charade almost immediately after the Malfoys walk out of the front door. So why isn't Rowling writing Quirrell to behave in the exact same way here? In any event, the chapter ends with the Golden Trio thinking that Snape is only one solved obstacle away from stealing the Sorcerer's Stone, and since the secret to that obstacle is held by the teacher with the least spine, they think Snape will have successfully stolen the stone in less than a week. So in this chapter, the main plot advancement is figuring out exactly what it is that Fluffy is guarding. This plot advancement feels natural and organic, and is one of the few times that Harry's memory will be used in a natural and organic manner in order to advance the plot. Sadly, this is the last time the Chocolate Frog cards will play a major role in the story. From this point on, they will only be mentioned once or twice per book, and only in passing. Harry's primary character development comes in his catching the Golden Snitch in record time. In the previous game, he caught the Snitch almost by accident, as he was trying to remount his own broom. But here, there was no fluke about it. He caught the snitch entirely from his own skill. Ron does fuck all in this chapter. Moving on, Hermione's primary contribution in this chapter is figuring out that Fluffy is guarding Flamel's Sorcerer's Stone, and I once again have to cringe at how it's always Hermione and her books that ends up saving the day. This early in the series, it's too early not to notice, but coming from the perspective of a guy who has read every book more times than I can count, it gets repetitive after a while. About three quarters of the time, the plot will be advanced simply because Hermione is reading about the solution in a book, and it gets annoying after a while. Neville comes off the weakest. His entire shtick this chapter is being Malfoy's new target for bullying. 
When he takes the Golden Trio's advice and actually stands up to Malfoy, he gets a concussion for his troubles. Yeah, teach you to stand up to bullies. Malfoy, conversely, comes out of this chapter looking the strongest. Not only does he successfully bully Neville twice, but his only real comeuppance is a black eye. Not detention, not puts from Slytherin, just a black eye. That's not nearly good enough. Just a single black eye that will probably be mended within a day. Honestly, Rowling needs to write bullies as getting a little bit more comeuppance than that. Well, next time, Hagrid will get his greatest wish, at least for a little while. So tune in next time when I review Chapter 14, Norbert the Norwegian Ridgeback. In the meantime, however, I am Acerthorn, and I will see you guys later. Peace!